I'm going to talk about uh, development on production, which is always a big oh no for everyone. And it's primarily, I believe it's because you will eventually affect the users that are there. But it's a, you know, I start out with a, with a quote that I need to add to all of my uh, talks, essentially, that if debugging is the process of removing it, then programming is the, the process of adding bugs to the the system. But this is a story that starts with a project called OpenShift IO, if anyone knows about that before. Have you heard about it? Some I know know it, know it more than others, but it's essentially a project that, that set out to create a developer uh, SaaS, in the sense that it was supposed to automate all the the, uh, the processes around a project, so automatically set up, uh, build pipelines, create a project for you through a simple UI where you can essentially just say, hey, I want to make a Go service that connects to these type of services, and so now you have a repository. That repository automatically deploys to, to a certain uh, cluster and so on for you. And in that process of building that, it started out as a greenfield project in the beginning. And coming out from a lot of the developers from from the from tooling, uh, from libraries, and not necessarily experienced cloud developers. Uh, but the beginning is always nice in a project. You can always start out with with just a service or a application that you run on your local machine. And the world is kind of nice. You can start, you can debug it, you can do whatever you want. And as it starts to kind of grow out a bit more, uh, you start to get into the containers and so on. This was a um, platform or a software as a service that was going to run on top of OpenShift, so eventually it would have to to be some form of containers. And still, in the, early, in the early days, there was just a couple of containers. There was a few services. Easy enough to run through something like Minishift or, or some form of local OpenShift instance, instance that, you can run in your, that, that you can run on your own machine. <coughs> And then you start to run into the kind of the distributed computing from things that you don't have to deal with when you have a monolith or one service that the network isn't reliable and there is latency and the bandwidth is the internet and so on. And you start to throw the developer experience out, out the window. Because when it runs in OpenShift or in a container platform, it's not as easy as it used to be. There used to be that one little process that you can deal with, and you can run a database on the side, and you were kind of fine. So as developers, we wanted to get the speed back, essentially. We had problems with getting this to run in a proper way. So we were still on the local cloud that you ran on your own machine. So each developer had their own cloud instance, essentially, trying to run this whole app. And the tools we were looking at then uh, to kind of take back some of the control we lost with going to a, to a container runtime uh, was things like Squash, to be able to debug the services as they're running in the cluster, uh, which has nice um, uh, ID integration, and you can essentially just select the process that you, or the the pod that you want to debug, and it will connect and set it up for you. Another one was telepresence. Uh, what that does is essentially you tell it which deployment do you want to do you want to develop on locally, which is out, outside of the cluster. Then it changes the deployment uh, in the cluster, installs a proxy instead, and then reroutes the traffic to your local machine, and then. 
from your local machine out back into the cluster. So it becomes similar to if the, the local service was in the cluster. There are certain small differences, but you're kind of getting somewhere closer. Um, some other tools around the same bit, but it's essentially squash, squash for debugging and telepresence for kind of the local experience, but still having a local cluster. So we have the local experience outside of local cluster. And then the project grows, or grew rather, and it became more and more services and more and more different pipelines that were uh, going into to the different uh, different environments. And it started to become impossible to run that had on your own machine. Uh, your laptop essentially burn up. Uh, when you have 30, 40, 50 different services that are all going to run and they're all going to have some special setup somewhere, whether it's OpenShift or MiniShift or whatever, and you end up with a complete mess, essentially. So to fix that, you move to a, to a developer cloud, which is outside of your, your, um, your, um, your laptop, and then you potentially have a testing cloud and a staging cloud. And we've all probably been in projects that has stage and test environments and so on. And the theory is that they all look the same, but they never actually do. So the chances that something gets deployed to the test environment works when it comes to production is fairly slim. Or that you're seeing different errors in staging, either because the infrastructure, infrastructure is different or because the version of something is different, or you have 50 different streams of services that are at different stages in a development cycle continuously being deployed. So which version you're actually targeting in a different environment also is kind of magical. So if it passed in development, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily the same version you're going to hit in staging. So, so that doesn't really help. You get a lot of moving pieces and you start to block each other because you have to wait with that version be before the other service can go through the all, all the way to prod. Of course, you can try to deal with contracts and so on, but that's also going to be not always work. And still, you don't have any local experience anymore. And challenging to keep them in sync. I mean, one thing is that you have the same versions of the services, but then you're missing the data as well. And trying to keep the data alive from the different environments is even more problematic. So you potentially hit something in prod because a, ver a version of a service returns a name with a dash in it for some reason because it's old data that you've never seen before in the staging environment, as, a, as an example. All these kind of small weird things that will happen. And of course it's extra cost as well. So if you're going to run four different clouds, then you're probably going to take some shortcuts. So the development cloud isn't actually a cloud cloud, it's running on some bare bones. So that has installation differences. And then the staging it doesn't have the same SLA, so when that comes out of disk, then there's no one who can fix that for a, a week or so, so you're kind of stuck. And then it's just the uncertainty. The, the reason why you have all of these different environments is essentially to, to ensure that when you go to prod, you have gone through all the different, or you have <laughs> ensured that it, it runs. But if all the different environments are different, then what does it matter when it actually hits prod? Because you're still wondering, will it work when it actually gets that's there. So you're not any more sure. You just know that you fixed a bunch of other issues along the way that may or may not actually influence prod. And prod has different issues again. So does it work? Who knows? 
so at this point uh, was when I left the Object IO project and started to realize that kind of there's a few more fundamental things in the kind of cloud development model that needs to be fixed before, uh, at least personally, where all the pipelines are automated is nice, but there's a whole lot of development tooling essentially that needs to go in before that. So we uh, started to look at an easy way to validate that the changes uh, that you're doing are not interfering with the other uh, services and users. As I was pointing to earlier, the main reason why you don't develop in prod is because you're going to affect someone. But if you could develop in production without affecting someone, then does it really matter? We wanted to interact with the other services as opposed to interact with um, another version of a service or an, another version of a service with, with a different data set. So actually touch the real thing as opposed to something that seems to be the real thing. And then also have the ability to develop this as if you were developing a local service in the way you do in your favorite tools and so on, without having to go necessarily to a cloud ID or similar. So uh, based on that, we started out with something we needed to run on, on top of OpenShift. Uh, we started looking at, uh, looking at telepresence. And then on top of that, Istio. I'm sure most of you know what Istio is. Not everyone, most people. I'm, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but this is essentially on like a top level uh, view what it does. It injects proxies into all the other server that, that runs next or intercepts all of the services and then inject uh, pro programmatic control over how the data flows, how it's how did authentication and so on. So you can control uh, without touching the service. And we were then wondering how can we actually use this to, to our advantage, essentially. Why is this working? So it injects security control and injects metrics, uh, failure recovery, but then on the interesting parts like traffic, traffic mirroring and traffic sp splitting and also, and also traffic routing. Uh, that's more information from there. So meet Ike. Ike is a project, or the prototype at least, of, of that ID that's, that's going to try to kind of fix this thing. Uh, so what is Ike? Ike is, on one side, it's a Kubernetes operator that coordinates the configuration of the cluster for you. And there's a command line tool that initiates essentially uh, what you want uh, the coordinator, or sorry, the operator to do. So let's have a look at what that actually looks like. Oops. So we have an application here today. Uh, this is the prod view. Uh, it's not a very fancy application, but it's essentially a call stack. <clears throat> so we have one service that calls two other services that call each each one on their own. So a total of five services. And uh, if we now initiate Ike, just to get it started, um, this is the command line that is being called. Oops. It's essentially saying that we want to do a development thing. This service doesn't require a local build since it's just a Ruby service. We want to target the service that's deployed that's called ratings version one, port mapping, and we want it to route based on this header and we want to watch this file and we call this session for feature X. 
the service that we're we are taking over with is fairly simple in this case. It's just returning some JSON. But if this is the production, what happened now is that I set up a um, set up a session for us. So we asked it essentially to say, find that one rating service. Then it reports back that okay, I've changed, I've created a clone of the deployment. I've modified a virtual service and it. Destination rule. And uh, what? Oops. And it's also set up now a special route or a special a URL for us. So when we hit the feature X, it will automatically add the headers to the calls that goes to the whole stack, which allows us to route just one specific part of it over to a new to our to our new service. So that's now the service that we have we have taken over. Uh, the one that's now called DevConf U instead of uh, the locations. But it's still the pr the production version of product page and reviews and the others that are being called. And if we can see here, we can now see that we have the local control over that service. Uh, that's service one, so we can change it to have some different color just for some effects. And that's the local control. Now it's still running, so the whole production environment is still in prod. There's only one certain sub subsection of it that is being taken over. On and we also have the ability to kind of join that session. So multiple developers can join in and have the same route, essentially, uh, and take over a different set of services. The only thing that happens is that it's, it's uh, oh, I can look at the Kiali view of it. So you have two subparts of the rating service. One that's the prod, which is TV one, and then the new one that is the feature X. Let's get this thing is ready. No, it's not. So there's a fun little bug. <laughs> see back on the prod view, of course, that there's nothing that has changed here. That still works as it was. There we go. Now we have two services that are up and running in the same kind of touted way. So developer one and two can can join in on whatever change that, whatever change that they need done. And then, of course, you can start up uh, A second session as well that we create another full route, but then runs a second version of a one specific service. Now there's two developer versions of of um, that service that is running in prod, but they're not seeing each other, and prod is still not seeing any of them, which gives you a quality really not quite like that. Some more traffic. There. Now we have two different versions of one of them. Any questions so far, by the way? Anyone? Everyone understand generally how this kind of can be used and works? And yeah, good. And of course, when you uh, have um, 
the operator a bit so it doesn't remove the, the actual external routes, but we can see when we shut down the local development here again that it returns to the normal prod versions in all of them. So that's just the kind of the beginning of what we were starting to look at. Uh, some of the next steps are uh, making this not just a command line tool, but an option to integrate it into VS Code or Eclipse and that kind of thing as well, to have it more, more, more easy accessible. Um, CI CD use cases is one of the things we're going to look at first to see when you can run a test in a CI system and you run it through a special route uh, with the new built uh, image and only the CI job can actually see that and if the CI job for instance uh, stops due to a test failure leaving that route up so you can join it and then debug the reason why it fails and so on have some interesting cases of course, this is all fun and games when you have stateless things, but when you have stateful full services, you have a whole range of other issues. Um, you probably don't want to change the database of a service just because you made some fun dev things or affect or affect the real users through through the databases and so on. So interesting things like maybe uh, routing to alternative databases or a form of uh, layered database where you can r write and change the data but only you within your own context can read them and so on. Those are interesting problems to solve down the line essentially. And whatever you guys could come up with that we would need to, to, to look at. The project is at Maestra Istio Workspace at the moment. We haven't come up with any better name for it than that. And um, are we alone? We're definitely not alone. So this, while the project is influenced by uh, something Bobbit Tables was uh, showing at OSCOM last year that they were doing at Namely, uh, which is, works similarly as this. Uh, Azure Dev Spaces and the Google Cloud Code as well is trying to do something similar at least. I'm not too deeply familiar with them. And that is essentially, unless anyone has any more questions of how we're going to work, what I wanted to show. It's a lot quicker than one expected. <laughs> Any questions? No? Well then, good. Then you got 30 minutes left. We're back.